Good evening and welcome to the 6 o'clock version of Romans chapter 9. <laughs> we are in Romans chapter 9. I'm so glad that you're here in our study. Uh, Paul has been working, uh, working diligently to explain, uh, explain his theology, his understanding of how his relationship to God works, how Gentile relationships to God work, and how all that has come to pass. Uh, come to pass. In the last couple of chapters, Paul has said some things that may cause his Jewish listeners and readers in the church in Rome to ask questions. Now, he used this uh, writing style, the diatribe. He's got this uh, imaginary opponent, and, and it's, it's nothing all, you know, it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. He's just anticipating the questions that his readers may have. He says something profound, and then he starts answering the question as if he's actually arguing with someone in the room, and that's how the text goes. So Paul makes a statement, and then he develops some line of arguments to support the statement, and then anticipating the next question, he starts again. At the beginning of chapter 9, uh, he makes a statement that gives uh, a great pause for his Jewish Readers. Now, he has uh, spent a lot of time in chapter 8, well, and 7, uh, reconciling everyone to God through Christ. It is by faith that you've been saved, not of works, not by the works of the law. And so they're, they're getting that. But then Paul moves into the blood relationship that Jewish people share with Abraham that define their relationship to God. The covenant promise was to Abraham. And so having his blood running through your veins, his DNA uh, makes you a child of the covenant, right? And Paul leads off here in chapter 9. I'm just going to go back and read these first couple of verses to rehearse a little bit. Chapter 9, verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, and the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. He goes on. Paul is in anguish over his blood relatives, Israelites, his fellow uh, Jewish people because they are outside the promise. Paul has already taught 
over and over and over uh, that uh, it is only through faith that we are reconciled to God, that uh, only through the blood of Christ. And he's, he's now expressing his anguish over his fellow Israelite brothers and sisters who have not obeyed the gospel, who have not come to faith in Christ and therefore are not children of the promise. And he's going to elaborate because when he makes a statement like this, he has some explaining to do, right? He has to help his readers understand his agony, and he does. He proceeds through several lines of argument. We get here to where we are tonight. Uh, We get to verse 19, and he's anticipating again uh, another question. If... uh, God has appointed Israel in his providence uh, to be the people through whom the promise comes. Well, does that not make him unjust or unjust uh, for those not to be included in the promise, not to receive the promise, right? They they have these questions. Well, uh, Paul goes on and, and gives them some examples about how God can use people even in their unfaithfulness you remember, uh, he spoke of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and God was still glorified. He still uh, rescued his people. God's will is done, and God is ensuring the line of the Messiah, the lineage of the Messiah. He's ensuring or making sure that his promise to Abram is kept, the covenant promise, and all that in spite of Pharaoh's hardened heart. Of course, in the example, we noted that uh, Paul is using Pharaoh as the the metaphor for Israel. In spite of Israel's unbelief, their hardness of heart, their rejection of Christ as the Messiah. In spite of their rejection of Christ as the Messiah, God still provided the Christ. Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, to be reconciled to God, God is still glorified even though Israel had hardened its heart against his son. That leads into the next question then. We're talking about God's providential care, his providential will and power. Here in verse 19, we press on in the same vein. You will say to me then, you know, he's anticipating their next argument. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, old man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to his molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which is prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. All right, back to verse 19. the, The question. This is his anticipated Uh, response, right? Why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? If you are to misunderstand what Paul was teaching about providential care, you would come away with the understanding that God is a, a master puppeteer, that we are devoid of free will and God decides who is uh, going to be uh, honorable and glorified in his example and those who are going to be evil. You would come come away from Paul's example of Pharaoh and believe that Pharaoh was uh, raised up by God to be evil. God caused him to be evil. And if that's what your misunderstanding is, naturally your question is going to be, if I turn out to be evil, and in this following text, a dishonorable vessel, if I turn out to be evil or have a hardened heart, is it not because God has made me that way How then can he condemn me? That is the question. How can he still find fault if he has predestined me to have a hardened heart or predestined me to be unfaithful? That's a fair question, right? How could God condemn if he made me this way? 
Okay, so Paul's first response here, right? Uh, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? That is actually, uh, we see this in Job as well, the same attitude. Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? Okay, God is creator. He is the, we'll say, the designer, the artist. He's the one molding the vessel. He can make the vessel for whatever use he wants to make it for is the idea we have authority. That's what's behind the text, right? God's authority to do as he pleases with that which he has created. God is going to affect his will in order to keep his covenant promise to Abraham and bring the Messiah History has to prevail. The line has to prevail in order for the Messiah to be born. The line of Abraham, then the Davidic covenant, not to muddy the water. That was another covenant that had to be kept in order for Christ to be born. The line of David and Bethlehem, that's uh, part of the covenant promise as well of the Messiah. God has the authority, he has the right to make those things happen, right? Right? We're going to explore that just a little bit more. We're going to press on here. Romans 9, 22 to 24. What if God, desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he's prepared beforehand for glory. This is one of those really long sentences of Paul's. Even us whom he's called, not from the Gentiles only, but also. Let's go back to the first couple lines here. Desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power. God has his plan. His, His justice is going to be seen. His grace, his mercy, his power is going to be seen. But we have this endured word here. He has endured with much patience. It's the idea that God is... Patient with those who are disobedient, those who are are wrathful in the example here that God has patience with them. Uh, Last week, the example was Pharaoh. God had sent several plagues. Pharaoh had hardened his own heart uh, in two or three occasions before God ever is mentioned as hardening Pharaoh's heart. So Uh, opportunity to change is given. We'll word it that way. Opportunity to change is there. Now, uh, there are chosen vessels. Let's see, there's there's two vessels here. Let's see, we got a vessel of wrath that's prepared for destruction and a vessel of mercy that is prepared for glory. Two different vessels made by the same pair of hands, right? The vessel is created, and each vessel has a, a purpose. That's uh, pretty interesting because we talked about how Pharaoh had a choice to make, and he chose to harden his heart. But what about vessels? Paul talks about vessels again. In 2 Timothy, we, we want to understand what Paul is saying. We're going to stay with Paul and let him explain what he's talking about here. And he does so in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. We get that idea, right? I've used the analogy for the example of my, my grandma's uh, fancy living room, the formal living room. I remember golden spoons and fancy china teacups and things like that and porcelain dolls and such. It was very, very, uh, we, we weren't allowed to go in there kind of a thing. You got, you got that. You didn't just go grab up one of them spoons to go steer your hot chocolate or to eat your cereal, your cocoa puffs or whatever. You didn't use those spoons for that. There were other spoons for that for particular use. You have vessels of gold and silver, they're for one thing. They're, 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 they're used for the honorable thing, for the good thing, you know, the special things, right? And then you have vessels of wood and clay, and, and they're, they're not used for the really good stuff. You, you use those for some of the other stuff, some of the, some of the gross stuff, that kind of thing. You, you don't use them for just anything. 
So they, they have a purpose. Each vessel is made by the same person in this example, but they have different purposes, right? But what's peculiar, what's interesting is how Paul follows that up in verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. The cool thing about the vessel is, is it's got the same potter making both vessels, but the vessel gets to choose whether it's going to be a vessel for honorable use or for dishonorable. Uh, we can cleanse ourselves, is what Paul says there in verse 21. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable. So we have choice. We like choice. Choice is good. I like choice. You want a Big Mac or a Whopper? I'm going to choose a Big Mac. I'm not a Burger King guy. I like to choose. I want to be able to choose that for myself. We get to choose what kind of vessel we are going to be. And within that realm of choice, whichever thing we choose, ultimately God is going to be glorified. That's, that's sort of the whole, whole point of this section is God's providential care and his power and ability to choose to allow Gentiles into the covenant, to allow them to be, as he's going to call them, children of the promise, grafted in. They are adopted. We are adopted as sons because we are heirs of the promise. Not not the covenant. We're not heirs of the covenant because the covenant has to do with the blood, the family relation to Abraham. Those who are true sons of God are sons of God by faith. We're heirs of the promise, and we are sons of God through the blood of Christ, not Abraham. And so Paul's example here, whether, whether we choose to be an honorable vessel or a dishonorable vessel, we are children of God when we are, what? When we obey the gospel. We place our faith in Christ. All the way back to chapter 6, when we're baptized into Christ and arise and walk in newness of life. It is that is those first steps of cleansing blood, uh, the, the blood of Christ we encounter in baptism. Our sins are washed away. And then we live a life of the holy vessel, the cleansed vessel. We cleanse ourselves. We put away those uh, past works of our past life, uh, right? And we live as sons of God. Problem is, is Paul is in anguish because his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters did not come to faith in Christ. Therefore, they are not heirs of the promise. They are, well, in the analogy here, vessels for dishonorable use. A vessel stored up for wrath because they have not put their faith in the Messiah that God sent them. So God worked his power, his providential uh, care and, and, and power through the dishonorable vessel. As Paul's point is God can choose to use either vessel and he will be glorified. Either way, much like he was glorified through Pharaoh's hardened heart, he is glorified through Christ, even though Israel is in unbelief. Pretty, pretty powerful message there. It's both comforting and scary. Comforting to know that it, if I were to sow sin and, and mess up, I'm not going to thwart God's plan for humanity. I don't have that ability. God's providential care and power is going to see to it that his will is done. Uh, so that's comforting. It's also not comforting to know that uh, I could so choose to defile myself that I could remove myself from the promise. Okay. Now, as it gets us up through 21, 25, uh, Paul is going to move to an example of 
from the prophet Hosea. And it's interesting because Paul takes this passage from Hosea and he uses it for his particular purpose. Uh, in Hosea, this is directed sh- directly to Israel uh, in the time that they are deported to Assyrian captivity and they're coming back. And here, Paul directs it towards Gentile audiences and Jewish audiences. It's interesting. Verse 25, 26, uh, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Paul is using his passage in Hosea to explain the inclusion of Gentiles in the promise. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. 27 to 29, Paul switches over to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. The passage in Isaiah is a, it's one of the the pieces to what we call remnant theology. Throughout the history of Well, uh, humankind, remnant theology sort of shows itself. It begins most notably with God preserving Noah and his family in the flood. God preserves a faithful remnant. We see it with uh, Noah later, and in big big points here, uh, the remnant of Israel that returned from captivity and resettled. Uh, that's remnant theology, or even before that, excuse me, even before that, we have Elijah during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. He feels like he's the only faithful person left in Israel, but there's the 7,000. Even God makes a statement. This is his, his remnant. God always preserves a remnant. There is always a thread. There's always a few In the New Testament, remnant theology typically includes Matthew uh, 7, where Christ is speaking. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Uh, Straight is the gate. Narrow and few there be who find it. This is remnant theology, uh, that uh, the number of, of, of the remnant is actually much smaller than the group of people who presume themselves to be included in that remnant. And so it's remnant theology. And Paul is, is actually talking about this. He's talking of the remnant here of Israel. The number of the sons of Israel is the sand of the sea, a reference to the covenant, Abrahamic covenant. But only a remnant of them will be saved. And he's writing to a handful of Jewish Christians. At Rome. So while he's explaining his anguish for his Jewish, unbelieving Jewish brothers and sisters, he's also consoling believing uh, Jewish believers in the church in Rome, describing them as faithful remnant. You always want to be a part of the remnant. Be a remnant. Being a remnant is good in the text of Scripture. Remnant's good. The Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth and without delay part of the judgment prophecy of Isaiah, of course. And uh, even further pressing, uh, Paul includes the last part of it. The Lord of O's had not left us offspring. He had not left us a remnant. They would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. They would have been annihilated. Pretty, Pretty powerful words here. The crux of chapter 9 is God, uh, God is Paul focusing on God's providential care. And at the risk of oversimplifying, God's will is going to be done whether we are hard-hearted or whether we are 
righteous. God and his uh, providence, his will is going to be done. He has uh, foreseen all the eventualities. He is going to keep his promise. And that, that can very well be sort of an underlying layer of what Paul is teaching here, that God is a promise keeper. He's demonstrated, even through the text of chapter 9 here, that God has kept covenant with Abram. He even, even mentions as such here in his quote of Isaiah, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea. That was part of the covenant. Your, your family, your offspring will be as innumerable as the sand of the seashore. He says, Paul, is, Paul is getting there. God has kept his promise. He has kept his covenant. It is Israel. Israel is the one that turned their back on him. We could argue from history. We know Israel's unfaithfulness throughout the Old Testament, right? We know their unfaithfulness during the first century in the life of Christ. Unfaithfulness. Paul is just acknowledging that acknowledging how God is bringing about his righteous redemption through his son, even raising him up out of an unfaithful people. That's, uh, that's God's providential care, his providential power. Okay. you have any thoughts or questions about this section? We're going to stop here and uh, pick up in verse 30 next time. But do you have any, any thoughts or any questions that you want to... Uh, to discuss about this section. Okay, we're going to pick up verse 30 next week. I do want to extend the invitation. If any of you may need the prayers of the church, put Christ on in baptism. It's a good night for both. You're surrounded by people who care about you and love you. We would love to help you this evening. Won't you come as we stand and we sing?